Hello, Crossover. How you doing? Hey, it's good to see all of you. It really is. So now, Mark's Gospel, Chapter 4, as we continue to go through the Gospel of Mark together, Jesus was always active, always working. He was the man of action. Now, today I'm going to do something a little bit differently than I normally do. Usually I read a short passage of Scripture, as you know, but today I'm going to read to you an entire chapter. Are you up for that? Chapter 4 is unusual in that our Lord tells a parable. And then he immediately gives the interpretation of the parable. So in order to really have justice with the chapter, you have to read the parable and its explanation. But the chapter is kind of short. And you start reading with me now. It'll be on the screens. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large they got into a boat and set it out in the lake. All the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so they did not bear again, or bear any grain, excuse me. The other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said, Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, The secret in the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that, this quotation now from Isaiah 6, they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding, otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmers sow the seed, sows the word, excuse me. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. So others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. The reason Jesus tells parables is to make the truth easily understood, not to hide the truth. Now, you might think, because parables are sometimes mysterious and you have to ponder about them, think about them a little bit, that he's telling these things to hide what he's trying to bring forth rather than make it clear to us. But that's not what our Lord is doing. Our Lord never tries to trick us. He never tries to hide what is true. He always wants to make the truth known. That's why at this point he has this great crowd following him. The crowd has been estimated by scholars to be between 50 and 60,000 people. My goodness. They're so large that he cannot just teach them directly. He has to go out into the water in a boat or he's going to be crushed by the crowd. And so they're kind of like up on the seashore, a natural amphitheater. He's out in the boat. He's teaching. He's so magnetic. He's so powerful. The things he's teaching are so insightful that it's changing lives. They want to hear him. So he's telling parables so that they could understand, not so that they could be misled. Now, for example, here. They understood agriculture. They understood what it was for a sower to sow seed. And what would happen in those days, farming was not well developed yet, they did what was called broadcast spreading. In fact, the word broadcast, we're broadcasting right now. All those folks out there in Brazil and Germany and Australia watching me on the internet, ha, 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 ha. Anyway, we are broadcasting. And so that word broadcast comes from broadcast spreading. The sower would have a bag around his waist, filled full of seed. He would go out into the field. He'd put his hand down into the bag. He would take out the seed and he would throw it. They were familiar with that. 
And so as soon as our Lord mentioned a sower and seed, they said, ah, yes, I've seen that happen or I've done that myself. So he told the story about a sower sowing seed to make it so they could understand what he was saying. But you can come back and say to me, well, the disciples didn't understand. They asked for an explanation. Now, I don't think of myself as being a spiritual genius. I really don't. But I pretty much, without explanation, catch this parable. So which means that the disciples were spiritual dunces. They weren't, they weren't very sharp. And what's funny about this is that they were the best he had. <laughs> Those were the 12 that he picked. But they didn't get it. So, you know, I don't, I, the fact that they don't understand doesn't mean it wasn't meant to be understood. It's simply that they were kind of slow to catch on to things. And also our Lord uh, quotes from Isaiah. And he says that if I teach this way, it will be so that those on the outside will see but not understand what they're seeing. They'll hear, but they won't catch on to what's being taught. Otherwise, if I made it clear, they would turn and be saved. Well, first we have to understand what it means by those on the outside. In the context of that day, it was the scribes, it was the Pharisees, it was teachers of the law who were resistant to what our Lord was saying and they didn't want to hear, they didn't want to understand. He's not talking about the 50 or 60,000 who were there to hear what he was saying. He wanted to teach them. He wanted to change their lives. He wanted to make a difference. He wanted them to come into the kingdom. And so he's saying that there's people on the outside, well, they'll see, they'll hear, but they won't catch on. If they did catch on, they might get saved. Now, I've said it again because it's not the best translation. Let me read to you what the message says. He told them, you've been given insight into God's kingdom. You know how it works. Now listen, but to those who can't see it yet, everything comes in stories. Creating readiness, nudging them toward receptive insight. These are people whose eyes are open but don't see a thing, whose ears are open but don't understand a word, who avoid making an about face and getting forgiven. Or as one of the other translations says, these people won't believe because that's exactly what they're hoping for. They don't want it. So what our Lord is saying here is that I'm teaching it in parables so even those outside can be nudged slowly towards the truth and they can understand and they can believe. This means that all of us here, that our Lord wants us to understand. He wants us to see. He wants us to catch the parable. And even if you're the most resistant person in all the world, he's going to do everything he can to nudge you closer and closer to understanding what the truth is. Now I'm going to tell you, very briefly, exactly what this parable says, what it means. It's about sowing, receiving the seed. Let me say it differently. It's about the gospel being spread and our receiving it. It's about, are you listening now? It's about receiving and believing. Receiving and believing. God has always worked the same way. He's always done the same thing. It's our receiving what he says and then believing in what he's told us. It's about him giving us something, our receiving it and believing in what it is. Which reminds me of a joke. <laughs> you, you know, you had an extra hour of sleep last night. You know that, right? You should be alive right now. You should be feeling good. This is not a spring ahead Sunday. This is a fall back Sunday, right? So... Uh, it, let me say it again. It sort of reminds me of a joke. This uh, old woman is outside of an office building every day selling pretzels for a dollar. An office man walks by. You know, a guy, a businessman works in the office. He, he walks by and he looks at the, and he feels kind of sorry for us. So he puts a dollar in her bucket every day, then take a pretzel and goes into the office building. Does this for three years. And one day he puts his dollar in the bucket and the woman grabs his arm. He says, I know what you're going to say to me, ma'am. You're going to say, why do you put a, a dollar in every day and don't take a pretzel? She said, no, I was going to tell you that pretzels have gone up to a dollar fifty. <laughs> you see, if you get an extra hour of sleep, you just go into a stupor. That's what it is. You're in a stupor right now. Now, now listen, 
The rules had changed. They were $1.50. God never changes the rules. He never moves the goalposts. Are you listening? It's always receiving and believing. It's always been receiving and believing. It always will be receiving and believing. The rules do not change. And so what our Lord is saying to us is that here's how it works. You receive what the Word says, and then you believe in what the Word says. It's always been that way. And so the parable makes it clear. It doesn't hide the truth. So the question now comes, then how come some people don't receive? How come some people don't believe? After all, the thing we're talking about is the wonderful power of the gospel. It's about Jesus, his death, his resurrection. It's about lives being changed. It's about people finding happiness and joy. And let me just say, as I'm passing along, that people can see this. The best people in all the world, the ones that have the best lives, are the people who know the power of the gospel. So it's very clear that this works when people receive and believe. But some people don't. Why don't some people receive? Well, our Lord says it's because of the kind of person they are. It's not the sower's fault. It's not the seed's fault. It's the soil's fault. Are you getting this? It's because of the kind of person that you are, that measures how well you will receive, that measures how much progress that you make. Some of the seed falls on the path. Now the path is uh, hard, it may be no, 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 no grass, nothing, no, no dirt, nothing, just, just path. It's been trampled down, it's been made flat. And the seed falls on that, and because it can't get water, it can't get the, the, the heat, it, 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 it doesn't put down any root, and it just lays there. And a bird comes along and eats it. The Lord said, this is Satan. Some people are so involved with the things of Satan. They're so much in love with their sin. They're so much in love with what they do, with their disobedience, with how they live. They're so much in love with it that whenever the word hits them, it just make, make, makes no sense to them. And Satan pulls it out. Now, as I go along, I want to say that everybody here is one of the kinds of soils. This is exhaustive. Everyone here is one of these soils. And so most likely there's somebody here who loves their sin and loves the world so much that when they hear what the gospel says, they don't believe because they don't want it. Because the want it means to change their life. That Satan's things are more important to them than God's things. Now, other people are like rocky ground. Now, here the, the, the seed can sink into the crevices, and there might be some, some dirt there, and the seed begins to germinate. In fact, um, it, it warms up very quickly because it's rocky ground, and so the, the seed has the heat that it needs and maybe the water that it needs. But almost immediately, it begins to die out because there's no roots. So it, it germinates very quickly, but it dies out because there's no roots. And the Lord says, well, this is the people who receive joyfully... But pretty soon they recognize how tough it is to really believe and have a changed life. And because of how the world treats them out there, a believer. By the way, I had a young lady come at the early service and I, we talked together for a moment. And she was talking about, to, to me about how hard it is for her to live the kind of life she knows that God wants her to live. And you know she's right. It used to be that, well, sin's always been around, but it used to be not long ago that if you were a sinner and you did things that were wrong, people said, well, you shouldn't be doing that. Now people say, go ahead and do it. <laughs> it's good what you're doing. We like what you're doing. And so, you know, this is the way it is. Some people respond with joy, but then things get tough. Now, really, this is an emotional thing. People are excited because they you know I got a lot of problems and troubles in my life and I hear about this possibility of a new life and I, and I want to believe in Jesus and I go to church and everybody's there is excited. Yes, everybody's excited. Everybody's happy, and it just sort of wears off on them. They get real excited and happy, too. I have been a pastor for, well, since 1979. It's hard, I know it's hard to believe, as youthful as I look. And I have seen hundreds, if not thousands, of people who have come to church, even made a decision. They come for six, seven, eight weeks. And then, slowly, they taper off, and you never see them again. And I used to be, I'd go find them. I'd go find them. 
Let me tell you, that doesn't work very well. What are you checking up on me for? Why are you looking for... What are you, you, you mean I don't come to church, you check up on me? <laughs> well, I don't do that anymore. It kind of reminds me of the spiritual. Some people go to church just to sing and shout. But after six weeks, they're all turned out. <laughs> so they get excited. They make a decision. They seem like it's real. But because it's not, and it was just the motion, as soon as life gets tough, they fall away. Now, other people, other seed that's sown, and it begins to grow, but it's on the kind of ground that there's thorns there, there's, there's weeds there, and the weeds and the, the thorns choke out the growth. They never are successful in their experience with Jesus. They never produce any kind of, of uh, crop for him. They're just choked out. I had a friend, uh, my neighbor, in fact, at my house, I used to live in Jolliffe Wood, and he had a hard time with his yard. He tried over and over again. Why do some yards do well and some yards don't? Do you have any idea? I don't know. Anyway, he, he, he tried very hard over a period of years to have a good yard. And so one year, he killed everything in his yard. He killed every blade of grass. He killed every weed. He killed everything. And then he paid a lot of money. And you know, topsoil is expensive. It costs a lot of money. So he paid you know, hundreds of dollars to bring topsoil in, had it spread all over his yard, and then he put down a professional grade seed. The side of the bag said 99.9% .9 grass, only one tenth of 1% weeds. Well, I saw him in his front yard. I went over to see him and talk to him. He was crying. I'm not kidding you. Literally, he was crying. And the reason is that not one blade of grass grew. It was all weeds. The brand new professional grade grass seed. And it was the kind of weed I'd never seen before. They, they, they were weird things like little trees and these, these large leafy things with serrated edges. They look like weeds from Mars. And he was crying. He said, I, I planted the best I did not go. <laughs> now I'm sure that there was grass in the bag. But there also were a lot of weeds. And what happened was that when the grass began to grow, the weeds had already taken the nourishment, the weeds had already taken the sunlight, the weeds were choking out the grass, it never grew. Our Lord said, this is because there are people who have worries and problems and troubles. Or the opposite, they have great wealth and it chokes out their growth. Now are you listening? I think most likely, I think most likely that, and remember I said it was exhaustive, that all kinds of responses are here, possible responses. Most likely, the most number of people here who have not yet responded to what the gospel says are people who have wanted to respond. You have thought about responding. Maybe you did respond. But your worries and the difficulty of life, I mean, life just grinds you out. The problem with life is that it's daily. And it's one day after the other with no hope and no strength and just grinds the faith out of your life. Well, the opposite also can be true, that your wealth. And you say, well, you know, I'm not a rich person. And we've talked about this when we've done uh, discussions from Scripture about what Scripture says about giving, about financial things. But the truth is that you are a wealthy person. You are richer than 99.9% .9 of all the people who ever lived. Most, now, I'm, now I say this, I don't mean to leave you out if you know, but most people here have more than one television set. You have more than one car. You have central heating and air conditioning. If you want to go on a trip to some place, where, where do you all go to? I don't know. You want to go on a trip? You can afford to go. Even if you have to save up for a year, you can afford to go. Most of us here, if you wanted to, you've been to Disney World. Most of us here can buy clothes, even if you're buying them from Target. Most of us can buy. We have things. And what happens is we love 
our comfort and our leisure and our freedom and our wealth more than we love God, and we never produce for Him. We never do. It just chokes us, the weeds just choke us right out, just like my poor friend Daryl Minky's yard was nothing but weeds. So listen, those are three responses that ends up that you don't know, you don't understand, you don't have what he wants to give you. You have received, but you haven't believed. But there are some people who receive it gladly. Again, the translation's poor. It's not that some produce 30 and some, some produce 60, some produce 100. It's an it's a, it's a ever-growing amount of harvest. So it's a harvest that was not expected. 6, 30, 60, 100. So in other words, people respond and then they produce in their life a great reward for God. Now you're listening. I want to remind you of something. Our Lord said, you come, be my disciple, I'll make you a fisher of men. Do you remember this? The, 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 the abundance here, the growth here, the prosperity here is not your being more holy, but that's a good thing. It's not whether you go to church or not. That's a good thing. It's not how much money you give. That's all, those are all good things. But instead, it's how much you influence the world around you for the kingdom of God. Now, let me tell you why the church in America is dying. Let me tell you why. Are you listening? It's because we have allowed our emotionalism and our shallowness and our wealth and our troubles to choke out our enthusiasm for God and His kingdom, and we never change anyone or anything. And until that changes, there'll be no harvest. Are you getting this? Until it changes, there'll be no harvest. As long as we love our lives more than we love God, we will not influence this world. We will not influence America. It will not happen. The other day, my uh, daughter-in-law and son, Aunt Josh, and, Ke- Josh and, uh, and Sarah, asked us to take them to... Um, to Costco to get a Christmas tree for the new house. What happened was that Sarah's mom and step, and dad and stepmom had said, we'll buy you a tree for the new house. And, and you come, will you take us there to pick it up? So I thought, okay, they paid for it. We'll put it in our car. It's even. <laughs> and so we're driving to Costco to pick up the tree. And Sarah said, Ernie, I, I want to tell you something Josh didn't want me to tell you, but we bought, a, I bought, excuse me, $1,000 worth of Bitcoins in 2009. Now, I follow this kind of thing. You know what Bitcoin is? A Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency that is encrypted using blockchaining, so it cannot be broken. Do you understand now what it is? <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I keep, you, I'm breaking myself up. It doesn't matter what you know what it is, but you've probably heard of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a, is a currency that doesn't really, is attached to any nation state. It's strictly on computers. And now you can, even on Amazon or, or uh, eBay, use Bitcoin to make transactions. Sometimes countries do it one to the other. There's only 21 million Bitcoins. They haven't been coined or printed. They're all on a computer, but there's only 21 million of them. And they're bought and sold, traded back and forth. And what's happened is, since 2009, Bitcoins have gone up 6,000%. So if you bought $1,000 worth of Bitcoins in 2009, you'd be worth $6 million now. <laughs> Wouldn't you have liked to have bought Apple at $12 a share? It's split four times since it was $12 a share. And, and on Friday, it closed at, at $164 a share. Man, it, I always miss out. And I don't know I've missed out until I've already missed out. I wish I could see the future, you know. Wouldn't it be great to be able to see the future and say, oh, yeah, I'll buy that Bitcoin stuff. I'll get $1,000 worth, and then seven years later, you're worth $6 million. Well, you know what? God has made a tremendous investment in you, in you. He has planted the precious seed of the gospel. He wants you to receive and believe. And then, through your life, begin to change the world around you. That's what he wants. And that's why the church across the world in some places is growing very rapidly because 
people in those places like Africa and China have believed and have given themselves 100% to it and they're changing the world around them and it will not happen for us until we receive and believe. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this powerful parable that our Lord told about how like a, a, a sower, Jesus and now since him many different people who preach and teach the word have been sowing the seed, spreading it out so that people like, like we who are here today can receive it and believe in it. And after receiving and believing, begin to produce a crop. 30, 60, 100 times what was planted in us. In other words, it's your will, Father, for each of us here to be a fisher of men, to change the world around us, to change the people around us, to live a life of faith, have people see it in us as they see it in us to change the world around us so other people can come and believe too. Maybe some of us here received, but we've been very resistant. Satan has come down and plucked the seed out. I pray today we'll be nudged towards faith. Others have believed only out of emotion. Others have because of their worries or because of their wealth. Their faith has been choked out. But we want to receive and believe. I pray now, Father, you'll bless this time. May there be decisions for Christ. May we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.